Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the Bridgewater Historical Society. What a crowd. Wow. We're <laughs> 2019 season now. Uh, this is our first uh, presentation, our first opening. We're so happy to have all of you here. Um, I hope we're all friendly today because we're. <laughs> um, we have a great program for you today. Howard Coffin. Um, we'll be talking about, uh, I guess, uh, people were thinking that climate change has already hit way back in 1816. Uh, Howard, as many of you know, has been around Vermont, seventh generation Vermonter. Uh, he has four books, some for sale today. To, um, Civil War, Something Abides, Discovering the Civil War in Today's Vermont, Full Duty, Vermont in the Civil War, Nine Months to Gettysburg and the Battered Stars, as well as Guns Over the Champlain Valley, which is a book about military sites along the Champlain Corridor. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Howard. I just vacated a seat here. <laughs> Ooh, you better remember that. <laughs> you learned something. Can you hear me? Good. Okay, back there. Come on in. Come on in. We get if you. Uh, we got time here. Nothing better to do, have we? Uh, well, I I will be doing something this afternoon that I don't usually do, and. I'll be reading quite a lot because there's so many quotations. Uh, my aging brain can't remember them all, but and so anyway, I'll be looking down a bit. Uh, but um, this is the town to talk about a year of the cold because Bridgewater people used to freeze the old folks <laughs> all winter long. Freeze them in the fall, thaw them out in the spring. <laughs> and it's true, because it was in the Rutland Herald. <laughs> right? right? And I worked for the Rutland Herald. I never wrote a lie in the Rutland Herald. <laughs> I also discovered the Side Hill Cruncher. Anybody remember that? It's a strange beast that roams the Shattagee Hills. Part deer, part wild boar. Legs are shorter on one side than the other. <laughs> yeah, because running around those hills wore them down, and it became a genetic thing. I did a story on that in 1966, and it set a record for letters to the editor, the Rutland Herald. <laughs> Some people called it the Side Hill Gouger. But that story about freezing up the old folks has persisted. And there's somebody missing from the crowd today, and I think it's because she hasn't been thawed yet. <laughs> Judy Merriam Holm. So if anybody sells, sees Judy, uh, would you say that I said that about her? But mainly I'm disgusted because I hear she's on a Civil War bus tour, and it's not mine. So anyway, pass the word on to Judy. But that's... Anyway, that's all. We got to get to the matter of the day here because it is a beautiful day. And thank you for coming on a day like this. The morning of September 6, 1814, a British army of 10,000 crossed the international border into New York State, close by Lake Champlain. Marching south into the United States of America were perhaps the world's finest soldiers, veterans of the Napoleonic Wars. The decisive battle of the War of 1812 was about to happen. It had been a strange two-year war, much fought over trade rights. Now the British had come again against the United States as they had at Ticonderoga, Saratoga, Yorktown. Behind hastily completed fortifications 
on the south bank of the Saranac River at Plattsburgh, New York, was a ragtag American army of 4,000 men. 2,500 men of that force were not New Yorkers, but Vermont militia, who had rallied to their village greens on hearing that again the British were coming. Now, all of you are saying, did I come to the right talk? <laughs> Just wait a minute. We'll get there. Okay. So the Vermonters had gone across Lake Champlain. It was like Dunkirk in reverse. Uh, they just, any boat that could be found, you know, somebody's rowboat, somebody's sailboat, a scow, took the Vermonters to New York as fast as they could, come, they could get there, and uh, off they went and gathered at Plattsburgh and outnumbered the New Yorkers. I'll be darned. I'm very proud of that. Someday I want to put a monument there while the Vermonters were on New York soil. I, I want to do that. The British went into camp on the north of the Saranac River, which goes through Plattsburgh, and skirmishing across the river began. Waiting close by in Plattsburgh Bay, behind the protection of Cumberland Head, it's a peninsula that comes down, separates the lake from the bay, was an American fleet led by Commodore Thomas McDonough, a Maryland man. And the fleet, incidentally, most of it had been built at Virgins the previous winter, up the Otter Creek. The morning of September 11, 1814, a mighty British fleet appeared off Cumberland Head, sailing before a strong north wind. Spotting the American ships, the British swung west, then north, and were at close range. There at close range is the American fleet, right there, waiting for them. McDonough was a genius, and he had already outwitted the British, making impossible what the British wanted, which was a long-range gun duel. Their cannon were bigger, but suddenly the Americans were right in front of them. Their shorter-range cannon were effective. As the British warships advanced against McDonough's hastily trained sailors and against the wind, three miles away along the Saranac River, British infantry faked a major assault on the town of Plattsburgh, and then three, went three miles upstream and crossed at a remote ford. But Vermonters were waiting right in the woods for them, and a very spirited infantry battle began on the south bank of the Saranac. Back in Plattsburgh Bay, the British opened fire. One of the first shots hit a cage on McDonough's flagship, sending the ship's pet rooster to the yard arms, <laughs> where he crowed on the sailors below. <laughs> McDonough aimed a cannon for the first shot, the Americans' first American shot, and with incredible luck, it ruined the steering mechanism of one of the British uh, big ships. The crippled vessel soon ran aground on Crab Island and was out of the battle. And now the largest royal ship, the Confiance, biggest warship that ever sailed on Champlain, 36 heavy cannon, was hit. And soon it was unable to turn about to use its broadsides. A man who watched from the shore said, the firing was terrific, fairly shaking the ground, and so rapid that it seemed to be one continuous roar intermingled with spiteful flashing from the mouths of guns and dense clouds of smoke soon hung over the two fleets. At one point, small British gunboats closed on the American flagship, intent on boarding it, but McDonough, with pistols blazing, fought off the attack. It was all over in two hours, as the decks of the British ships literally ran red with blood. The British surrendered most formally, on McDonough's flagship. When word of the American naval victory reached the British infantry, orders were given to march back north to His Majesty's lands. The decisive battle of the War of 1812 was over. The British would sign the Treaty of Ghent, ending the war on Christmas Eve, 1814. There, I had to get my military stuff in, you see. <laughs> but the effects of the war would linger. 
particularly in Vermont. Partly in revenge, New England markets were flooded with British goods. An economic depression hit northern New England. In the war's aftermath, as did an epidemic of spotted fever, which some call the plague. The post-war year of 1815 proved to be a tough one for Vermont and New Hampshire. Now, you're going to hear me talk quite a lot today about New Hampshire because, well, it's close by, but I was invited last year to speak at the New Hampshire Historical Society on this subject, and so I had to hurriedly research New Hampshire. And the best stuff I found, I'll, I'm going to add into this talk, there's some good stuff from New Hampshire, but mostly Vermont. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that, that's a wide river at Connecticut. Much wider than it looks. <laughs> anyway, the post-war year of 1815, tough one for Vermont and New Hampshire. And that autumn brought harsh wintry weather, though the 18, uh, that autumn brought harsh weather, though the 1815-16 winter was really rather mild. I first heard about 1800 and froze to death from my grandmother. Uh, Bertha Minerva Metcalf Coffin. Uh, it's lived in Woodstock. And when it was really cold weather sometimes, uh, she'd say, oh my gosh, Howard, it's 1800 and froze to death. I didn't really know what she meant, but I began to pick it up uh, over the years. Uh, that was a favorite saying of hers. And then came 1816, a year forever recalled in Vermont history indeed in the history of the world. A mighty time of cold and darkness was coming to the struggling people of Vermont and certainly New Hampshire and to much of the world. According to a fine book by Nicholas and William Klingemann, The Year Without Summer and the Volcano that Darkened the World, the 500 years that preceded 1800 were part of a period of global cooling known as the Little Ice Age. New England had for centuries from time to time experienced very late and very early frosts. As the 1800s began, speculation on possible causes of the chill weather included an un unusual number of sunspots. Could that be causing it? Also, suspicion turned to the presence on many barn roofs of a new and ingenious safety device called lightning rods. Were those attracting the strange weather? <laughs> Beginning in 1809, several major volcanic eruptions had occurred in the South Pacific. In 1812, two mountains exploded in the Indian Ocean. In 1814, one let loose in the Philippines. Then came April 5, 1815. On that fateful day, a sizable mountain in the Indonesian archipelago blew its top. Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa in the Dutch East Indies, now known as Indonesia. That's a mouthful right there, that sentence. <laughs> a series of eruptions sent ash and smoke 25 miles into the sky. People 800 miles distant heard the explosion. Estimates of the number of killed near the uh, eruption reached 15,000. Another 80,000 perished in the next 12 months from disease and starvation. Within a full day, a massive mushroom-shaped cloud covered hundreds of miles of the Pacific, a portent, perhaps, of our A and H-bomb tests in the 50s in the, in the uh, Pacific, the atolls that were destroyed. Later research put the power of the Tambora eruption at 100 times the St. Helens explosion. My God. Dylan Darcy Wood, a University of Illinois climate change researcher, recently published an article, 1816, the year without summer, a study of the worldwide effects of Tambora. She wrote that the entire East Indian region was plunged into darkness. She said the global history of the event is dizzy in scale and difficult to articulate. The volcanic cloud contained millions of tons of ash. I was an historian friend of mine, Larry Coffin. He's a distant cousin. I've got more cousins. My grand, great grandfather had 12 siblings, you know, and uh, they all married, and they're all over here. 
My cousin Corinne's right here. Just met her, didn't know anything about her. <laughs> They're everywhere. Jilsons and Wardwells and Harlow's and oh my God, they, that's my sister Jane right there too. She's related. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. Where was I? Yeah, Larry Coffin. <laughs> cousin Larry Coffin, a good historian. He said uh, he wrote a giant aerosol, an ash cloud, was suspended in the atmosphere and it began to move around the world, reflecting sunlight, causing cooler temperatures and abnormal weather. Within weeks, spectacular sunsets were seen in Europe and New England. In September 1815, when snow fell, it had a brown and red tinge. As I said, the winter of 1516 was a mild one, though by long, by long ago standards, and you know, as we all know, we old-timers, winters aren't what they used to be. Although this last one was a pretty good try. A little damp, though, for my taste, I'll tell you. Much of the snow had disappeared by early March 1816. Late April produced a heat wave. The estimable Vermont historian Abby Maria Hemingway wrote that this all brought on, quote, expectations of a fruitful harvest and an abundant season. In late April, some Vermont farmers began putting in crops as temperatures reached the 80s. And certainly growing up in Vermont, I remember the old advice, never plant till Memorial Day. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, I heard that. That mildness continued into early June, but only until the 6th. That night, a blizzard struck. Throughout Vermont, snow and sometimes hail fell. Snow totals reached 12 inches with drifts to 3 feet. In St. Johnsbury, Jacob Ide recorded, quote, frost and ice were as common as buttercups usually were. Some sheep that had just been shorn froze to death. Birds who could find no shelter also perished. The Windsor Journal newspaper noted snow on Mount Escutney, in, uh, and deep snow on Mount Escutney. It was recorded that the farmers turned their cattle into the forest, where they found underbrush and leaves to subsist on. June 7th, James Winchester near Craftsbury said that his uncle set out in the storm for sheep, for the sheep lot saying, if I am not back in an hour, call the neighbors and start them after me. June is a bad month to get buried in the snow. <laughs> Had a sense of humor. Three days later, searchers found the family sheep safe under a pine bough shelter the uncle had built. They found the uncle a mile away headed in the wrong direction from home, barely alive in the snow, he survived. The North Star newspaper in Danville, snow 20 inches on June 8th, water froze an inch thick. It summed up the first half of June, melancholy weather. The shoots of leaves of old forest trees, which were just putting forth in corn and vegetable gardens that were out of the ground were mostly killed. Benjamin Harwood in Bennington on June 8th. The awful scene continued. Sweeping blasts from the north all four part of the day. The noted Vermont historian Walter Hill Crockett wrote, the leaves of the trees were killed and the beaches did not put out leaves again that year. Sheep had just been sheared and where it was possible, the fleeces were bound around the bodies of these animals to keep them from freezing. A Hardwick man, the forest leaves were all killed and the woods went in mourning through the summer. Normal weather returned at mid-June. Temperatures reached the 80s in southern Vermont. It did not last. Certainly, Vermont was not the only place suffering. The Buffalo, New York Gazette in June 21 spoke of an uncommonly cool spring at Cape May, New Jersey, freezing temperatures in June. In the first week of July came scattered frosts throughout Vermont. Then the weather warmed, but on July 21st, frost touched most of the state, killing corn in northern Vermont. Also, as July progressed, no rain, and a severe drought settled on Vermont. A vivid halo around the sun and sunspots were seen all summer long. What was happening? The people were terrified. There was no connection made with anything, any cause. Below average temperatures continued in September, and though a, top, a tropical storm touched Massachusetts, little rain even in southern Vermont. 
forest fires broke out in the Adirondacks. Again, the historian Crockett. After the June storm, the, co the corn which had been sprouted gave promise of maturing, but there was a heavy frost on September 10th, just as the ears were ready for roasting, which put an end to the hope of a late harvest. Northeast Kingdom man wrote, James Gooding was so hopeless over the prospects that he killed all his cattle and then hanged himself, after vainly trying to make his wife do away with herself also, <laughs> to escape the terrible and gradual death by freezing and starvation, which he believed was to be the common doom. Still no rain, and in late September, Burlington's Northern Sentinel reported that the forest fires burning uh, from Plattsburgh to Ticonderoga produced smoke that impeded navigation on Champlain, and breathing became difficult at times. Talk about scary. The Windsor Journal said in October, the crops of wheat were generally good, but everything else has failed, and even this can hardly be converted into flour for want of sufficient water to keep mills in operation. In short, we are something like the soldier who had no allowance and no kettle to cook it in. <laughs> Certainly there were food shortages in, Ver in Vermont, but no reports of starvation survived. Eating habits were very much changed. In the upper Connecticut Valley, the year 1816 became known as the mackerel year. Fish were brought from the seacoast to replace the regular pork supply cut by the scarcity of, of feed. Fortunately, heavier than usual runs of fish came up the Missisquoi River from Lake Champlain to Swanton. Large nets were put out and operated day and night as people came for miles to trade for fish, many bringing maple products. In Richford, on the Canadian border, the town historian said, the cold season of 1816 nearly desolated the town, very few inhabitants remaining, and they nearly starved for want of bread. Not an ear of corn that was fit to eat was raised in the town. Throughout Vermont, seed prices soared. Uh, corn prices went through the roof. But in Bellows Falls, Squire Thomas Bellows sold seed corn at normal prices to people in need, many coming from the north. His acts of compassion are said to have been celebrated even in poems. In Pittsford, a, a farmer on Corn Hill gave away his corn. In Tinmouth, a farmer did the same thing. However, a Newbury, Vermont man went to Connecticut and brought a, lar a large barge up the Connecticut River loaded with corn. They had the uh, they had the locks on the Connecticut at that time. You could bring ships up or, or, or barges. Uh, he brought this uh, barge up the river loaded with corn, which he sold for two fifty a bushel, two and a half times normal price. There we go. Vermonters cooked hedgehogs and boiled nettles as staples of their diet, along with wild turnip root. The weather moved one Vermonter to verse, and he wrote of 1816, don't know who it was, if God withholds those milder rays, and sends us frosts and chilling days. Even snow as late as 8th of June that nips the fruit in early blooms. Shall we be frightened of such things? No, rather frightened at our sins. <laughs> oh. In summing up 1816, Walter Crockett wrote, there was, a, there was great suffering, but little if any actual starvation. Days of fasting and prayer were observed in the churches. As a rule, people helped each other generously, dividing the little they possessed with others less fortunate. A Coventry family reduced a half a loaf of bread, divide, divided this meager supply with a neighbor. Many sheep and cattle perished, owing to the failure of the hay crop. The catastrophe of 1816 surely was the most important meteorological event of the, of the 19th century. People simply did not know the cause of all their troubles. If there were newspaper accounts of the Pacific volcanoes, no connection was made. Speculation intensified, and many saw the hand of an angry god at work. In Bethel, work on the village's first church had begun in 1815. A church was needed. Services had been held in private homes. 
but, but the work intensified as the weather uh, chilled and the church was uh, dedicated, uh, consecrated on Christmas Eve as a gift to the Lord. The new church was moving to completion at the head of Church Street in Burlington, that great brick perch up there. And the plans were drafted for a new church in Canaan. In New Hampshire, incidentally, churches went up everywhere. They must have been, really been scared over there. <laughs> the Vermont History Freedom and Unity, published in, in the 1990s, said religious enthusiasm declined during the 1812 war years, but a new revivalistic surge commenced in 1816. The authors cited the combination of natural catastrophe and financial disarray that followed the war. Now let's take a look across the Connecticut there for a, 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 some, a little information on, on New Hampshire. Uh, and so now I was a re resident of New Hampshire for seven years. West Lebanon, that's as close as you could come to staying in Vermont. Uh, uh, let me, uh, a, a quote from the town historian in Warren, which is in the northern part of the state. The war came first, that of 1812, then the pestilence, then the Black Plague, then in, in 1816 famous, famine almost looked into our valley among the hills. The lamps of heaven kept their orbit, but their face was cheerless. For a few days in summer, people had good slaying. It seemed as if the order of the seasons was being reversed. On the 6th of June, the meeting of the Great and General Court of New Hampshire, the snow fell seven inches. Also, July 8th, there was a deep and deadly frost that killed and palsied the vegetables. Then one August day in Warren, the sky was lurid in the west. The clouds thickened fast. Hailstones rattled on the forest and the wind shook the tops of trees. Suddenly it grew dark. Then in the twinkling of an eye, the hurricane leaped like a maniac from the skies, and howling, crashing, dizzying it came. Little, William Little described how Warren uh, in the wind leveled a, a swath three miles long and 20 yards wide, it seemed to have been felled by one demonic fury stroke. Wow. He wrote, Stephen Richardson's barn was blown down. Shingles carried two miles to Amos Little's back pasture. Nathan Libby's house was unroofed and furniture scattered over the whole farm. The looking glass was blown 30 yards and deposited on a stone without breaking it. <laughs> Fences were prostrated. Cows lifted from their feet and sheep were killed. In bush and settlement, upland and interville, great was its havoc and fearful. Thus passed the season. Autumn returned, alas, not to fill the barn with a generous sheaf, but the eye with the tear of disappointment. Winter came, and with it would come starvation. But for the tolerably good cop of rye, which supplied the inhabitants with bread, so horrible was the year 1816 that many grew disheartened, and many sold out and went south and west. But in 18617, a change came. Everything was lovely. And when the year closed, people said it was the happiest one they had ever seen. But we're getting ahead of our story here, 1817. William Plummer in New Hampshire was a notable man who twice served as governor of New Hampshire and a U.S. senator. Governor at the time that this year occurs. His notes in 1816 are from Epping on the coast where he lived and conquered where he, uh, he went to be governor. He also spent a lot of time that year in Hanover. The state was in a dispute with Dartmouth College, which became, before the, the Supreme Court, the Dartmouth College case, one of the landmark decisions in the history uh, of the country. And, and he was, Plummer was, 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 was uh, negotiating with college officials about who was going to have control of the Dartmouth trustees. Uh, the case before the Supreme Court was argued by Daniel Webster, who was, of course, a Dartmouth graduate. And I worked at Dartmouth seven years. And before the Supreme Court, with John, Justice John Marshall presiding, and he wrote the decision in this case, which went in Dartmouth's favor, Webster made the most famous quote in Dartmouth's history. 
And when I worked at Dartmouth, I got so sick of hearing this over and over and over again. This is what Webster said to the Supreme Court of the United States. It is, sir, a small college, but there are those who love it. Go over there today and listen, you'll hear it. Especially when they get a few in them, you know. <laughs> anyway, in New Hampshire, April 1st, 1816, brought a thunderstorm rare for that date with lightning damage. After two weeks of chill, temperatures soared to 80. But up in Lancaster, diarist Adino Brackett, Lancaster to the north on May 19th, said the state of the season has been uniformly cold. It is stowed day after day at Epping. May ended warm, and June began with temperatures in the 80s. Massachusetts recorded 100 degrees the 1st of May. In Concord, the 7th and 8th, the same weather phenomena is here in Vermont. Uh, some snow, water freezing. Mary Brackett in Lancaster, wife of a dino. Snow three days in succession in June. Corn entirely killed. Trees wear the appearance of October. It is our duty to submit to this calamity with resignation as well as to others. Sixty miles to the east in Vermont, at Cabot, 18 inches of snow fell. Uh, there's been speculation that there was quite a lot more snow in Vermont than New Hampshire because the, the storms coming from the west hit our mountains and hills and, and, and drained them. I don't know whether that's true or not. I have no idea, but uh, there's been some speculation on that. July produced dry weather in New England, particularly at Epping. Uh, Plummer uh, used words uh, uh, like parched and dusty over and over in his diary. And then in, in August, Plummer went to Hanover for a week of dealing with Dartmouth, and he noted a hard frost that in many places of, of uh, vast extent killed Indian corn, particularly on the riverlands, uh, potatoes, pumpkins, cucumbers, all dead. Lancaster, this morning, a dreary appearance was exhibited. Uh, this is uh, late July, so severe a frost, so early in the year. And then, September 1816, fires broke out throughout the Northeast. The Klingemans talk of smoke from farmers' brush fires, getting out of control, causing shipwrecks along the northern New England coast, where ships could not, they could not see each other, could not see the, the lighthouses. From the, here's an interesting one from the Warner, New Hampshire, uh, town historian. Of course, Warner, you go through it on the way on 89 when you're going to Boston, you know, down to Concord. Not a month in the whole season escaped the frost, and the corn crop, as well as certain other crops, was substantially de destroyed. There was a great scarcity in the country and much suffering in the fall and winter. Corn went from 50 cents a barrel to $4. It was at this time that Enoch Dalton, afterward a deacon in the Congregational Church, inquired of Enoch Morrill, a brother church member, at the close of the services one Sabbath day, if he would spare one bushel of corn. Ask me tomorrow, said Morrill, and I will tell you. On Monday morning, Dalton trudged over to Morrill's on Pumpkin Hill, a distance of four miles, with a bag under his arm, and asked for the corn that I spoke to you about. The reply was this, I have no corn to sell. I spoke to you as I did, that you might learn to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. <laughs> Doesn't that sound Yankee? <laughs> and quickly from the history of uh, New, New Market on the coast, frost and cold all summer long. Crops had been planted once, twice, thrice, the killing frost every month of the year and no harvest. No harvest would be a long, barren winter. We thank the Lord for the fish and for the tough salt hay of the lamprey marshes. They carefully hoarded what little uh, seed corn was left uh, for us, uh, neighbors, I guess, and they waited patiently for another spring. Well, and if the cold wasn't bad enough, New Hampshire and some of Vermont badly hit by something like a plague, something like a plague. 
It started in the extremities and moved inward. Death often came within 24 hours. Now hear this. 18, in 1817, after this year, many residents of New Hampshire and Vermont left for warmer climes. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, the Great Lakes area. They, they left in droves and farms sold cheap. Certainly a major effect of the cold year was migration, both from Vermont and New Hampshire and some from Maine. According to Vermont historian Lewis Stilwell, something, it seemed, had gone permanently wrong with the weather. And when this cold season piled itself on top of all preceding afflictions, a good many Vermonters were ready to quit. The local historian in Hardwick, Vermont, said there were many emigrations from Hardwick to what was then called the West, <laughs> but few went farther than the Genesee Valley in New York. The vast area known as the Ohio country was opening for settlement, and a few Vermonters headed that far. In all, it's estimated that 15,000 people left Vermont right after this year. After that year, a migration not equaled until after the Civil War. 15,000 Vermonters left Vermont right after the Civil War. Professor Stillwell refer referenced Genesee fever and Ohio fever inflicting Vermont. The New Langdon, New Hampshire town history, when the cold period passed, it was followed by a long period of drought that ruined all crops except potatoes. Some left our town for other fields of adventure in the great western regions they looked upon as an El Dorado. One family escaping from Vermont was the Smiths, formerly of Sharon, Vermont, who in 1816 were renting a house in Norwich. The Smiths had a son, Joseph, born in 1805, who when they lived in Sharon had contracted a deadly disease. It was a New Hampshire doctor, the founder of Dartmouth Medical School, Nathan Smith, who journeyed into the Vermont hills to the Smiths' farm to save the seemingly doomed lad. After 1816, the Smiths were among those who gave up Vermont. They left for western New York to settle in Palmyra. Their son, Joseph, would say he found golden tablets and a new religion would come upon the earth, the Mormon faith. There's some uh, outcome. Yes, religion. In Warren, New Hampshire, there are historians. Some believe the plague year and the bad summer which followed were visible examples of God's wrath upon his wayward children. For the town of Warren had been established 50 years and there was still no sign of a church. Thune sots around Warren began to turn towards a house of worship and one was quickly built. Even the governors were stoking the religious fires Vermont Governor Jonas Galusha in 1816, proclamation, the disposer of, event, of events has seen fit in his holy providence to blast our expectations in the, later, the latest harvest. We ought to enter the courts of the Lord with penitence for, spring, for sin. Penitence for sin, prayer for pardon, and inscriptions of praise. In his inaugural address in 1816, Governor Plummer, said that a statewide religious revival was needed now. And uh, all through Vermont, attendance at churches increased. Certainly there were saints afoot. There was a man along the Connecticut River in Vermont who kept his food prices down. Here the history of Littleton, New Hampshire. The hay crop was materially injured and other vegetables were grown only in small quantities. Fortunately, Otis Warren and the Captain Pelleg place had raised large crops in 14 and 15 and was able in large measure to supply the demand for seed, corn, and oats in his farm in the Connecticut Meadows. Now there stands a monument on that farm for the man who gave away seed. It is thought that he saved some from starvation. So we have spoken about Vermont and New Hampshire, but the Tambor eruption was really a worldwide event. Darcy Wood wrote, 1816 was a time when the overwhelming majority of the world's population lived precariously from harvest to harvest. When the crops failed that year and again the next, starring rural legions from China to Ireland swarmed out of the countryside to market towns 
to beg for alms or sell their children in exchange for food. Famine-friendly diseases, cholera and typhus, stalk the globe from India to Italy, while the price of bread and rice soared. The world's staple of foods uh, were almost out of reach for most. And some did starve. Many starved in some places. That's a strange sentence. Across a European continent, devastated by the Napoleonic Wars, tens of thousands of unemployed veterans found themselves unable to feed their families. They gave vent to desperation in town square riots and military-style campaigns of arson, while governments everywhere feared re revolution. The 1816 catastrophe in some way touched most of the United States. In some areas, at least some discomfort was called, uh, though the calamities were mainly in the North Country. That year, 1816, hear this, Congress voted itself a handsome pay raise. <laughs> in response, American voters threw half of them out of office that year. That, by God, is democracy. <laughs> in Germany, in Germany, 1816 became known as the Year of the Beggar. Tourists on the continent mistook beggars moving along the roads for armies on the march. God. In June 1816, the writers Mary Shelley and Lord Byron went from England to the Alps with a group of English tourists, having planned a summer of hiking, scenery, and writing. But the cold hit Switzerland hard, and their summer was mainly spent huddled by the fireplace. Both wrote, and the weather had profound effect on what they produced. Byron composed a poem called Darkness. I had a dream, which was not a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came, and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation, and all hearts went into selfish prayer for light. My God, could that man write? Holy mackerel! Mary Shelley wrote home in early June from the shores of Lake Geneva. An almost perpetual rain confines us principally to the house. One night we enjoyed a finer storm that I had ever before beheld. The lake was lit up, the pines of Jura made visible, and all the scene illuminated for an instant, when a pitchy blackness succeeded, and the thunder came in frightful bursts over our heads amid the blackness. That stormy night she first got the idea for her famous novel. Shelley imagined her Dr. Frankenstein, waking from a nightmare to find his hideous creation at her bedside, looking on with watery but speculative eyes. <laughs> wow. The United Church of Bethel, my church, the one built in 1816, had a bicentennial celebration in 2016. We had a service in the evening, exactly on the 200th anniversary. And then we all went outdoors into a snowy landscape to watch some fireworks donated by one of the members. All was festive as the bombs burst above our tall steeple. But as they lit the night, many thoughts turned far back to the snowy landscape of the year of the church's birth. We had been talking about all this. And the explosions and spreading smoke brought thoughts of Tambora 
in the dark skies of long ago. The power of nature was raised in our thoughts. It came to mind that yes, in 1816 a great monster had stalked the seemingly fragile earth, and it was personified for many in Dr. Frankenstein's monster. In closing, let us also be mindful here in 2019 that a far greater monster than Frankenstein's or the year without summer today stocks our planet. Global warming is upon the earth and down the years will wreak far greater catastrophes than the famines and diseases brought on by the monster Pacific eruption. Let our thoughts, our prayers even go toward what even we few can do to help keep this planet lovely and all alone in space, capable of sustaining a human life worth living. As 1816 became history, people far and wide gave it names. The poverty year, the year of no summer, the year without sun, the cold year, the scarce year, the starving year, but generally, as my grandmother said, it was known as 1800 and froze to death. But for all that, 1816 went out rather mild, but 1817 turned nasty in February and March. In January 1817, St. Elmo's fire visited Vermont's strange lights, touched treetops, steeples, fence posts, and even people's hair. Talk about fright. Today, today there is no place to flee to. As we speak, more mighty bergs are calving from the Antarctic ice sheet, and the ancient ice expanse that covers vast Greenland is thinning and thinning and will disappear. Silent scientists say that as the ice caps melt, and apparently they are doomed to do so, the water will reach Lady Liberty's torch in New York Harbor. The, a few weeks ago, as the baseball season was beginning, in hope, and I guess the Red Sox are back on track, <laughs> I saw a bumper sticker in Montpelier that stopped me cold and led me to thinking about this subject we've talked about here today. And I will end with the words on that little sticker, which said simply and truthfully, nature bats last. Thanks for listening. <laughs> it's hot up here. I don't know if it is down there. I will take questions, but if, if, if people want to go out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful afternoon, I would not hold it against them. Uh, sir, yeah. Well, Howard, do you think I should cancel my subscri subscri subscription to the old farmer's mom and that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good reading. What the heck, you know? Well, we grow up with that, didn't we? Yes, sir. If you don't pay your real estate tax, your property goes to a real estate tax sale. Did many people lose their properties because they couldn't pay their real estate tax? If you had asked me who commanded Company C of the 12th Vermont Regiment, I could have told you. <laughs> My knowledge of this subject is about that deep. I don't know. Okay. And I learned a long time ago, if you don't know an answer to something, don't fake it. <laughs> because you get caught. I tried it once. Yes, <laughs> sorry. In your, in your research, did the suicide rate go up during that period of time because of the despair? I only found one mention of a suicide, uh, which is in there, uh, which doesn't say anything except it tells me that probably they didn't really go up much. That's the only reference I found. And you'd think that that would have, you know, if that had happened, that would have come up. But who knows, you know. But uh, that religious influence is mighty, you know. And you're not supposed to kill yourself. At least as I understand it.
Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh. Oh. There's an area in Weathersfield near the airport yes. that became known as Little Egypt because their crops didn't fail. And to this day, there's a brook there called the Little Nile. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. That's a new one on me. Will you stick around? I want to talk to you. Yeah, talk to her. <laughs> yes. uh, I want to add this to the next talk. Well, I, yeah. I have a, a, a second question. I was recently listening to a history podcast about the same subject, uh -huh. and they made the same. The speakers made the same connection that you did between uh, this era, the era of 1816, and the era of global warming. That. Um, that because Europe was more adversely affected than the United States, many uh, throngs of immigrants started flooding into the United States because they had no way of knowing that yeah. this weather change wasn't temporary. And we're seeing that same kind of immigration pattern today. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it ain't good. No. <laughs> you better get started. Yeah. Is there any connection between the uh, importation of merino sheep with with that time, I mean, make, producing animals that produce. That's please. an excellent question. It's a question I have not thought about at all. I would think probably there is, and once again, I, you know, that knowledge is about that deep. But I'm going to look into that and thank you, John. You know your history, okay? <laughs> thank you. Anyway. Well, I'm not sure just when the sheep was in 1815, 16. It's right along in that time. It's during the Napoleonic War period. Yeah, it yeah. is. Absolutely. I, I would guess, yes, but, you know, I can't give you an answer. All right, thank you. Thank you.